Hi, Design and Motioneers. This is just a little bit of an iLogic primer. It's been a while since I've done a video, so I thought I'd put it together to maybe show those of you who aren't already using iLogic a little bit about what it is and what it isn't. I tend to get this question all the time, what exactly is iLogic and what would I use it for? And it's a really hard one to answer because it has such a broad scope. So I'm just going to show you a few examples of bits and pieces and you can figure out how you might apply them to your real problems. So we're just going to start off with a standard part file in Inventor. I'm using Inventor 2015, but iLogic goes back as far as 2011 with a subscription pack. So there's your normal Inventor environment. If you go over to the Manage tab, you'll see that there's a little iLogic panel. If you click on the iLogic browser, it opens up this little browser and you won't have anything in there, yours will be completely blank. Now the key thing to remember is there's two sort of components to iLogic, rules and forms. If they're stored inside the file, they're those first two tabs, rules and forms. If they're stored externally in a text file, they're the next two, global forms and external rules. But global forms essentially perform the same function as forms and external rules perform the same functions as rules. So we're going to start with forms. Forms basically allow us to expose eye properties, parameters, uh, buttons, images, all those kinds of graphical elements uh, to the inventor user in an in a easy to use way. So let's just start off with some geometry. So we're going to specify a depth parameter and a width parameter. And I'm naming them on the fly so that I can access those parameter names later. So we'll now give it a height. Okay, there's our part. I'm just going to put a hole in the middle of that. And we'll give that hole a diameter of 200, and we'll go all the way through. Right, so to actually do the iLogic stuff, the first thing I'm going to do is right-click inside the iLogic Forms window and select Add Form. And what this does is it brings up a little preview of what my form is going to look like, as well as this little WYSIWYG editor. For those of you that don't know, WYSIWYG is what you see is what you get. So it's kind of a visual, a visual editor um, that allows you to place things on your form that will be able to be accessed later. So I'm just going to drag and drop depth, width and height. And just for fun, I'm going to change the control for the width parameter from a text box to a slider. And I'm going to say that the range of acceptable widths is anything from 100 to 1000 in increments of 10 mil. I'll click OK to that, and you can see I now have a button in my browser for the form. So if I select that, it brings up a form, you can see now I have a nice little slider that I can drag. But we have a problem. When I get below the diameter of the hole, the hole's obviously going to start to break through. This is where some logic would come in handy that would say, well, if the width gets below, say, the diameter of the hole plus 50 mil, we want to suppress it completely, and if the width is greater, then we'll keep it there. So knowing that our hole is 200 mil, we can build a rule. So I'm going to jump to the rules tab, and I'm going to right click in blank space and say add rule. And we'll call this rule hole suppression. And we're presented with another little editor. So to build up our rule, we have a series of standard snippets down the side, which are sort of standard bits of code. We've got a familiar little model browser, which shows us our parameters, the features, our view representations, bits and pieces about that model. And then we have the actual code window. 
Now, if you're not a programmer, this can be a little bit daunting when you start thinking, well, oh, I'm going to have to write formulas. But they've tried to make it very easy for you by creating these little drop downs, which have a lot of commonly used functions in them. So I'm, I'm going to uh, come up with a statement that in plain English says, if the width gets below 200, which is the diameter of our hole, plus perhaps 50 mil, we want to suppress that hole. And the way we do that in code is to use an if statement. So you can see here there's an if then end if statement. And if I click that, it'll put the code in for me. We now just need to replace my expression with our expression, which is simply we could type it, but I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to click on model parameters and say if width is less than 250. Then we wanted to do something and what do we want it to do we wanted to suppress a feature and the feature is a hole so in the left hand side you can see i've got a, a features snippets category and the one that i'm looking for is is active which in code speak says get get or set the activity of a feature so i'm going to click on there and you can see it says feature dot is active and then it's asking for a feature name so in the feature name I'm going to go up to my feature and I'm going to click on names and then I'm just going to double click the hole and it puts it in there for me and then I just need to tell it whether it is active or it doesn't so I'm going to say equals zero or I could write equals false they will they will work and that's fine so we'll click OK to that we'll go back to our form and we'll start to once more reduce the width now at a point, the hole disappears. We have a new problem though. When I start to increase it again, there's nothing to turn the hole back on again. If I go back and have a look at my rule, we can see that that's pretty clear. So all I have to do there is say, otherwise or else, I'll just copy and paste that in there. Otherwise the hole is active. Click OK. And now it disappears when it shrinks and it comes back when it grows. All pretty handy stuff. Now, the sharp ones of you will be saying, but I could already do that in Inventor. If I suppress this rule, I could already do that with feature suppression. So if I right click on my hole and go to properties, say suppress if width is less than 250 and the same thing happens and you'd be dead right that is available without iLogic what you can't do however is if we come back into our rule what you can't do with traditional feature suppression is things like this if the width is less than 250 then Let's make the part color red. Otherwise, we'll make the part color blue. Make sure I unsuppress my rule. Go back into the form. Below 250, we have a red part. Above 250, we have a blue part. So you can see there, while that might be a bit of a silly example, we've got a lot more flexibility and a lot more power over what we can do with our models. Those are just a couple of really basic examples in a part file. We can do similar things in assembly files. We can get assembly files to talk to part files or vice versa. But what's even perhaps more useful is the fact that we can even create iLogic inside drawings. So if you have a look at my drawing file here, I've created a parameter, and this might answer another question of yours. You may have wondered why there were parameters in drawings. Parameters have been put in drawings pretty much just for iLogic's use, because it allows you to store values and variables inside the drawing that then your iLogic rules can use. So you can see I've created a, a a numeric parameter inside the drawing called view proportion and I've given it a unitless 
unitless value of 0.25. What that represents is I want to be able to store somewhere a value that says my view width for this view should be a certain pr proportion of the page width. So if I was perhaps automating the creation of a whole lot of similar parts and I wanted to create a drawing once and not have to redraw it for every different size, I could build some smarts into the drawing, which means as the part changes, the drawing automatically updates. And I'll show you what I mean. So in my form, I have a value here, 0.25. I might say, let's make that 0.33 for a third, which means I want the width of that drawing view to be a third of the page size. Now when I click update, you'll see the drawing view jumps up. If I go back to 0.25, update view, it drops it back to a quarter of the view of the sheet width. Now it's important to understand that that's a proportion of the sheet width, not the scale of that drawing view. Which means that that part could be any size and it would change the view scale to mean that the drawing view would take up the same proportion of the sheet. So how did I do that? Basically, using my parameter for my target proportion, I built a little rule. And while it looks a little bit complicated at first, really what it's saying is that the scale of the drawing view should be the existing scale of the drawing view multiplied by my target view proportion divided by the current proportion that that view takes up of the sheet width. So what it's doing is it's looking at the existing scale, which is 0.14 to 1. It's looking at the width of that view as a proportion of the sheet width, and it's then manipulating the scale to get it to our target. And just to illustrate that a little bit clearer, if I turn on some sketch lines that I've created here, you'll see there that that view is indeed a quarter of the width of the sheet. And if I go back into my form and change it to 0.33, or let's go 0.5, you'll see that it's now half the width of the sheet. So you may choose to work with exact view scales rather than proportions of a sheet, but by doing it this way, what it means is that if I go back into the part and manipulate the proportions of that part, and then come back to my drawing by running the rule again that view will update to be once again a quarter of the width of the sheet so using rules like that and you'll see in the in the rules browser there are actually quite a lot related to drawings all to do with width height scales positioning all that kind of thing you can actually create fairly automated drawings that update sensibly when the geometry of the model changes. So for engineer to order type clients where you have a range of parts that may be of similar form but different sizes, this can be a really handy quick way of regenerating drawings. That's all I've got on that. We can go into more detail in iLogic at a later date. But really, the idea of this is to get those of you that aren't already using it, encourage you to have a play and come up with some use cases for yourself where it might be of assistance.